Good morning from New York City. Lovely weather today. Good weather for a ride on a motorcycle. Up to Dobbs Ferry to the Half Moon restaurant for lunch, I think. Later on. I'm going to carry notes here because of some calculations. Now normally, I can, I can derive all this stuff without notes, believe me. But it just slows me up that little bit. So I wrote things down in advance. All right? I could do all the derivations actually in five minutes. But it's just putting in the numbers. I can't be bothered to be fiddling around with a calculator. I did it beforehand. Now I'm going to derive some of the things that are of interest for the universe, the radius, the mass, the density, the volume, the age, by some simple um, assumptions. Uh, I'll then derive the Friedman equation for the case of k equals zero, the cosmology equation. There are a couple of main equations in cosmology, and that's one of them. Uh, it gives the density of the universe in terms of Hubble's constant. And I will show that I get the same result. And it's very interesting. I did this, these things many, many years ago when I was about 16. <clears throat> uh, kind of independently of anybody else. I think maybe um, some of the people in the 50s may have done these things before, but I'm not sure. Anyway, what we do is we assume that the universe is a black hole. Not quite, but it has a Schwarzschild radius. And we assume that the receding galaxies cannot go faster than the speed of light. Now, wait a minute. That may not be true. Receding galaxies could be going faster than the speed of light. However, if they are doing that, then they are out of the realms, out of the communication of us, so therefore not part of our universe. So our universe stops when the receding galaxy ends up going at the speed of light, whatever that means. It's to do with Hubble's law. Now, the general idea for Hubble's law is this. After Slipher noticed that uh, the <coughs> spiral nebulae in the universe, in the night sky, this is as early as 1920s or 30s or something, this is quite recent, were actually clusters of stars, galaxies actually, spiral nebulae. They were called spiral nebulae for a long time. Clouds, people thought they were. But they're actually island universes, as some people call them as well billions of stars, and we're in one ourselves. We're in the Milky Way, and on certain, in certain parts of the Earth, let's say where there's no light pollution, or there's no atmospheric pollution, or jet trails. One of the things that is affecting climate, by the way, in the world that we live in, is actually not the pollution in terms of CO2, it's actually jet trails, because the jet trails are making clouds, they're making us more Venus-like, all right? So, Hubble noticed that when you plot the speeds, that is V, the speed of recession of galaxies as you vary the distance, in other words, as they go further away, the graph is approximately a straight line. Approximately, they're scattered about this straight line. So let's put the straight line in. And it's one through the origin. So V equals H R. This is a straight line graph with a slope h, and h is Hubble's constant. Now, what's the fastest anything can go in our universe? It's the speed of light. So we say that at the edge, v equals c, you, the radius of our accessible universe, assuming the galaxies that we can access, if they're going faster than the speed of light, we can't see them, right? We can't talk to them. We can't get signals from them. We can't get information from them. Then they're out of our universe. So in our universe, C is a max. So the speed of our seeding galaxies at the edge is going to be C. That's the boundary. So therefore, then the R of the universe is C over H. We not to know what Hubble's constant is. Well, actually, it's measured to be approximately 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And a megaparsec is a million parsecs. 
okay, we need to have that. We need to have SI units. Parasites are no use for working with. So we need to know what Hubble's, what a parasite is. Well, it's 3.086 by 10 to the power of Sixteen meters. So therefore, a megaparsec. So this is going to be seventy thousand meters per second times one over three point zero eight six megaparsecs. Ten to the power of sixteen plus six. Six and six is twelve. And the final result, just to save time, is 2.03 by 10 to the power of minus 8 seconds to the minus 1. Hubble's constant, the way we use it. So we write that down and keep it. Actually, I want to write it down forevermore. Two point three by ten to the power minus eight is a much more useful number than the seventy kilometers per second per megaparsec. So let's put that into this equation. So that we get for the universe the speed of light over h, and that works out to be. Four point four by ten to the power of twenty-six meters. So get your head around that. So I erase the board because it's getting too complicated. This is the radius of the visible, accessible universe. Four point four by ten to the power of twenty-six meters, and the observed. I made a mistake. That's the observed. When I calculate that, I get a different one. I get one, sorry, 1.32. This works out to be, that goes into that 1.32 times. 2.3 into 3 is 1.32. 10 to the power of negative 18 times 10 to the power of 8 is 10 to the power of negative 8, negative 16, positive 26. So that's what it is. This is the observed speed. And compare that to what I just get. I get 1.32. Some people say that cosmology and astronomy are good enough to win orders of magnitude of the exponent. So this is the correct order of magnitude. This is the speed I get. This is the observed, sorry, radius of the universe. Calculating that way. Because we only use that all the time. So I'm going to get rid of all this stuff now and record that result. We don't need this. So that's all we need. We write down the other numbers that we need. We need G. So we need R, G, and C. Okay, and we've had H. Uh, H, I forgot, I wrote it down somewhere. by this method is the reciprocal of h. Let's call it the Hubble time, actually. 
and that's going to be seconds. So you can convert that to years if you want to, but that's good enough, right? Negative 18. So the age of the universe, the Hubble age, is about 10 to the power of 18 seconds. I'm not dwelling on that one too much because it's debatable about it. Okay, so the next thing we can calculate is the mass of the universe. Now, the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole uh, can be calculated just from the velocity, okay? The escape velocity. So R The ordinary escape velocity equation from Newtonian mechanics, if we require a speed of light escape velocity, the kinetic energy, therefore, can be equated to the potential energy to get the escape velocity to be c squared The Schwarzschild radius is without going near general relativity, just ordinary Newtonian mechanics for the escape velocity, as figured out by Michel John Mitchell, M I C H E L, 16th century, 17th century, and maybe Laplace also, okay? Dark stars they studied. I have a whole lecture on that, Introduction for Black Holes for Beginners. You can go and look at that to figure out where this stuff came from. So, if I want the mass of the universe, I take the Schwarzschild radius and solve for m. So m u is going to be c squared r over 2g. I'll put in the units separately. So, Cavendish measured the accelerator, sorry, the universal constant of gravitation in 1798 to be 6.67 by 10 to the power of minus 11 newton meters squared over kilograms there. I just have to put in for the radius of the universe, which I have up here. And I get for the mass of the universe 8.9. by 10 to the power of 52 kilograms. Now let's look at the observed mass of the universe. If you look up at the astronomy books, they'd say that the mass of the universe is 8 to the 10 to the power of 53 kilograms. So they're the same. So the mass of the universe, we calculated it almost exactly. And you saw where it came from? came from just small assumptions. Okay, so that's very good. Now I'm going to clean the board. I'm going to let you get your heads around that. Okay? Get your heads around that. Very neat results. I forget what it was. So we hit that one almost on the nail, straight on the nail. So, here we're getting lots of information already, um, and we can continue. the density of the universe. Okay, density is mass over volume. Now in terms of cosmology, sometimes this is called a critical density, a density which makes the universe flat. And it comes out of the Friedman equation. I will derive that Friedman equation for you simply again by a very simple process uh, due to Susskind. 
Um, but I kind of simplified it even further because I choose the case for what's known as k equals zero. Simple case because we don't want to complicate things. That's actually an integration constant. Okay, so the density of the universe is the mass over the volume. Okay, so the mass of the universe. Now there's two ways I can approach this. I can put in for the R cubed. And all those numbers. You get 9.2 by 10 to the power of uh, 78 cubic meters. So, mass of the universe is that. So divide by the mass and the, the mass by the volume, and I get 1.88. No, that's the observed one. Now the observed or the critical density that you look up in the book is 1.88 by 10 to the power of negative 26. And you see once again we're in the ballpark figure. See that there? Actually I'll do it a different way. Um, twice it. So I get a amount by a factor of two. All right? But still it's pretty good. And let's get rid of this now and continue. All right, now that's, but this is approximately the mass of about 10 protons, by the way. So, ten protons, I guess. Yeah, whatever in every cubic meter. We don't need this. Now, I'll just point out something. We'll do something else in a minute. Actually, let's record this up here. In other words, what I get, I get this one. Wait, no, this is not right. Negative, yeah. So I can erase that now, okay? Density of mass over volume, this is the result. Now there is a parameter called k in the Friedman equation that's derived, uh, I guess it's like this. The 
Robertson Walker metric has a little number in here called k, so we're going to set k in this equation to zero uh, for a special case. And then approaching this by general relativity. I think most things, because of the equivalence principle, not the equivalence principle, uh, what is it called? Anyway, everything has to reduce to Newtonian mechanics. If it's correct, if you're doing relativistic stuff, you have to be able to get the classical equation uh, for escape velocity. You have to be able to get Newtonian gravity from general relativity in the low energy case and things like that. All right, the Friedman equation k equals one. So we have the universe. Now, on the surface of the universe, at the very end, what's the escape velocity? Well, the escape velocity is like anything else. It's going to be the speed of light on the surface of the universe. Now, what can we do? Let's see. Um, we can write an equation for the escape velocity. Now the universe has a Robertson Walker metric. And this scale factor describes how the web of the universe increases with time. You can think of blowing up a balloon with lots of dots on it. The scale factor gives the distance between any two dots. But actually, this way, because this is r of t. So the r by the t is going to be the speed of the growth of the universe. Okay? So the r by the t we'll write as that. That's the v. The V that comes into the escape velocity. So if we write down an equation for some particle on the surface of the universe of mass m, and we use the equivalence principle to, ca to cancel that, we can write down this equation which is r dot squared, right? Now mass is 4 over 3 pi r cubed, so we can write r dot squared, and we'd substitute in for mass. Um, let's see, there's a factor of 2 here r dot squared over 2, in other words, v squared over 2, is this quantity here. r dot squared over 2 is going to be g mass over r squared. Now, did I do that right? Yeah, so now I'm going to bring up a, a t there. One power cancels. Um, Okay, I made a mistake for the escape velocity. This should be a r, g m m over r, the Newtonian potential. I'm terribly sorry. So this should be just an r. So this will be r squared. So now I bring the r dot down here. Now the mass of the universe actually has a row in it. I forgot to put that in too. Actually, 
actually that varies with time as well. G of t probably varies with time too. So now I've just worked out actually something very simple. Here's the result, and I just got it from the escape velocity. This result, and this is the Friedman equation. There's a row in there, which is depend on time. It's the Friedman equation. Or k equals zero, whatever the k is. We're not using it. Okay, so that's very interesting because h is actually r dot over r. Okay, it's a dynamic parameter. It just happens to be 70 kilometers per second at this epoch in our evolution of the universe. So, what can we say? We can write I'm missing something. Let me check. Now, I may be missing a factor of c, but I'll come back to it. So I can get an expression for the density of the universe from this one here. g is h squared over 8 pi g. And I need a c squared in there. So I put the question mark in, check later. Now, there are other things I can get. from the universe, and that is we can use the background black body radiation. I'll leave that for another analysis. I also have to check my result for the density of the universe, okay? I need a C squared in there. I'll work on that derivation, but you've had some interesting results already. Even the way I worked out these things, I get pretty good agreement with the standard situations.